Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the honor of coming before you in humility. We know we're nothing without you and without your Son. But by grace, through faith, you've changed everything, given us new life, and made us into something. Father, we thank you for using us for your glory. We thank you for your word and your spirit and your desire to pass your wisdom on to us. And most of all, Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whom you willingly gave up. You gave him up for our benefit so that whoever trusts in him can be saved. Father, please bless this time together in your word. Guide us and teach us by your spirit. It's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of your spirit. Amen. All right. Beware where you turn. Don't look to the right or to the left. The reason Holy Scripture often tells us to stand firm in the faith is because our hearts can be swayed by many things in this world. Again, the reason Holy Scripture often tells us to stand firm in the faith is because our hearts can be swayed by many things in this world. And there are many temptations along our spiritual walk to turn towards a false theology, an alternative gospel, or even just the idols in this world so that we don't bring glory to God. So let's start with a reminder of the brutal warfare going on around us in the spiritual realm. Uh, Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 as we kind of set the stage for this topic this morning. Spiritual warfare is absolutely brutal. And if we could see what's going on around us, we would be horrified, actually. It could be a nice sunny day with nice people around you. But if you could see the invisible battle for the souls of men and the evil behind a lot of influences in this world, uh, we'd be really surprised. So let this passage set the stage for our topic. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Take note here, especially those of you who are younger in the faith. Do you see who the battle is really against? Look at verse 12. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. But it's against the rulers and the powers and the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to what? Stand firm. And again it says in verse 14, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So there's a real battle going on, folks. And our hearts are there for the taking. Or are they? That's really our focus this morning. That's what Satan is after. Not just our overt actions, 
to be against God, but he's actually after our hearts, from which every action stems. So that's why this is so important, and that's why we're talking about the heart this morning. Beware where your heart turns. Every action stems from what first takes place in your heart. And Satan is very sly, remember. He's as slippery as his name, called the serpent. And we just read about our defense system in Ephesians chapter 6. Without submitting to God's word, and that's why I'm happy to see all of you here this morning and even a few new people here this morning. Without submitting to God's word and spirit on a daily basis, we will be easy prey for Satan's lies, for the ways of the kingdom of darkness in, in this world. And we will turn away from God's truth in some way. You could even think you're on the right path. You can even think you're doing the right thing or being a good person or whatever you think you're doing. But that's what deception's all about. When you think you're doing the right thing, but you're actually trapped in some wrong system of thinking. So without God's word and God's spirit protecting us on a daily basis, every day, we're in trouble. You will be turned away from God's truth in some area of your life. So again, remember the call in Ephesians 6 to stand firm in the faith. That is actually a call to guard your heart. As we press forward in this series, that's what we're going to be focusing on. So let's read a warning to all of us in Proverbs chapter 2. Go to Proverbs 2 verse 1. You know, there's, there's always uh, in this world a scheme conspiring against you, if you will. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is always a scheme behind the scenes that's being put together against you. Think about it that way. There's a spiritual battle going on, and there are certain people who are used by what we just read in Ephesians 6, certain spirits, to come against you in certain ways, to tempt you, to pull you away, to pull you down, to pull you away from intimacy with the Lord. So think about it that way. That's always going on behind the scenes. So look at Proverbs 2, verse 1. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her, wisdom, as silver, and search for her as for hidden treasures. Then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, and he preserves the way of his godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you, understanding will watch over you, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. And don't forget here in verse 12 who these men are influenced by, the kingdom of darkness which we just read about. Again, verse 12, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who delight in doing evil and rejoice in the perversity of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways, to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God and uh, for her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. And here, think of spiritual adultery against God with all of our idols that we follow, not just physical adultery here. 
Again, verse 18, for her house sinks down to death and her tracks lead to the dead. None who go to her return again, nor do they reach the paths of life. So you will walk in the way of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the treacherous will be uprooted from it. That's quite a warning to us. Notice those who live in evil, who follow the adulteress, either physically or spiritually. Where does all that begin? It begins in the heart. Incline your heart to understanding, in verse 2. Incline your heart to understanding. Because that wisdom is going to protect you from things like the adulteress. If your heart seeks God's wisdom and understanding in the fear of the Lord, God will protect you. As in verse 11, understanding will watch over you. You see? But it's only going to watch over you if you turn to it in your heart, if you turn to Him in your heart. They're one and the same. That's when He can watch over your heart. But if your heart wanders, if your heart gives in to follow evil men and perverse things, there will be a life of judgment and death, according to this passage. So guard your heart. We must beware where we turn, not just physically speaking. Turn to Proverbs 4, verse 1, for another similar warning. And this is all setting the stage for this topic, okay, about being aware, or being aware, I guess, where your heart turns. Proverbs 4, verse 1. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father, and give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, then he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Again, let your heart Hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Acquire wisdom. Acquire understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. Where do you think you embrace wisdom? Could it be in your heart? As in verse 4, let your heart hold fast my words. Again, verse 8, prize her, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace, she will present you with a crown of beauty. Hear, my son, and accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded, and if you run, you will not stumble. So take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. Look at that attitude towards wisdom. She is your life. If something is your life, you guard them with all your strength, right? With all your attention. And just to clarify, we're not speaking about gaining all kinds of worldly wisdom, but wisdom from the Word of God, period which is pure and perfect. That's what we're talking about. On the board, only God's wisdom from God's word can protect your heart from deception. That's the only protection you have in this world. God's word, God's wisdom. It's our only defense from the brilliant schemes of the devil's world. And they are brilliant. 
and look at verse 23 in Proverbs 4 as we finish this chapter. This really gets to the core of what we're talking about. Proverbs 4.23 Watch over your heart with all diligence. How many of us have that attitude? That, that in our attitude should be to fight tooth and nail to protect our hearts from deception. Watch over your heart with all diligence. For from it, your heart, flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. So where does any negative thinking or negative turning begin? In the heart. Watch your heart because ultimately it guides your feet either into trouble or away from trouble. And by the way, the Spirit has ordained this series this week for your protection. You should all look at it that way. The Spirit ordained this series. He guides teachers on what to teach. And this is ordained for everyone listening, including myself, for our own protection. He's warning us right now. And many times God warns us right before a battle, right before a spiritual challenge or confrontation. So eat it up. Take it in. This is here to give you strength and and wisdom. So the Spirit is stressing this today so that you can avoid much suffering and pain in this world, especially you young people. The Spirit is crying out, there's a new way to live. There's a new way to love, even. And it's God's way. You don't have to live like you did in the past. You don't have to stay in the same lifestyle that you were trapped in since childhood. You don't have to stay in that routine. You can literally turn around and decide to live in God's way and put all that behind you because it's garbage anyway. Gaining God's wisdom and guarding your hearts is so you don't destroy yourself with things that might look good on the outside but that lead to death. I've been thanking God lately, personally, for protecting me from myself. Anybody relate to that? Or giving me certain problems, even, to learn from and to keep occupied with. As we know, it's not good when you have too much time on your hands, period. What happens? Your heart strays. Your heart starts looking around to the right and to the left. Instead of keeping it on the cross in front of you and your purpose, your divine purpose for being alive. In the big picture, be thankful God is doing things in your life to keep you from self-destruction because the flesh is nasty. Don't underestimate it. Don't give it too much room to play or time even. So this following point on the board might seem overly simple to some of you, but the Spirit wanted me to put this on the board. Again, beware where you turn. Keep your nose in the word of God and keep busy with good things from the Lord. might seem overly simple, but aren't we here for simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ? Guard your heart. Don't look to the right or to the left. Keep your nose in the word of God and keep busy with good things from the Lord. One of the worst things we can do is underestimate our three spiritual enemies, which are the flesh, the devil, and the world system that he's created. Don't underestimate your spiritual enemies. You need the protection of God's word and spirit every day. Or you'll succumb to deceptions and pain and suffering and ultimately judgment of some kind in your life. So, Again, on the board, it's really simple. Beware where you turn. 
Keep your nose in the Word of God and keep busy with good things from the Lord. Now, I want to take a moment in this study. I was actually talking to a pastor about this topic and what I was going to be teaching while he was away. And, um, you know, through the Spirit, he gave me a little bit of direction on something to make you all aware of. So we're going to pause for a short time here and see what it means to guard your heart. What does the Bible talk about when it talks about the heart? So we're going to take a moment to examine that and get a good definition because the world gives us all different definitions of the heart, doesn't it? Especially, you know, movies and Hollywood. The heart is all over the place. What is the heart according to God? What is this thing called the heart? So we're going to see parts of a detailed definition on the board. And I took this from BibleStudyTools.com. So the word heart, if you see it in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew lebob or leib. And in the New Testament, it's the Greek cardia. And this word heart occurs over 1,000 times in the Bible, making it the most common anthropological term in the Scripture. It denotes a person's center for both physical and emotional, intellectual, moral activities. Sometimes it's used figuratively for any inaccessible thing. What does that mean? Well, you know, you can't see somebody's heart, right? It's inaccessible. It's hidden. And so that's what the Bible's talking about, the person's center. And it even involves mystery. As we go on, it says the heart's reasoning, as well as its feeling, depends on its moral condition. Jesus said that from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, as in Mark 7, 21. I hope you can see these scriptures on the board. They're a little light, but I'm not going to turn to them all. And if you want to write them down and turn to them all in your own private study, go right ahead. But again, the heart's reasoning, as well as its feeling, depends on its moral condition. Jesus said that from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts. Mark 7, 21. Because the human heart is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah 17, 9. And folly is found up in the heart of a child. Proverbs 22, 15. The Spirit of God must give humans a new heart. Jeremiah 31, 33, Ezekiel 36, 26. How does the Spirit of God give us a new heart? It's through faith that purifies it. Acts 15, 9, Ephesians 3, 17. So again, just to repeat, let's go back to these two slides. Again, heart occurs over 1,000 times in the Bible, making it the most common anthropological term in the Scripture. It denotes a person's center for both physical and emotional, intellectual, and moral activities. Sometimes it's used figuratively for any inaccessible thing. And the heart's reasoning, as well as its feeling, depends on its moral condition. Jesus said that from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts. Because the human heart is deceitful above all things, and folly is found up in the heart of a child, the Spirit of God must give humans a new heart through faith that purifies it. And that last phrase is very key, even with our last week's studies on walking by faith. So God brings all these things together perfectly in, in, you know, harmony. For us. So since we've been talking about walking by faith this past week, let's visit the scriptures on that last part of this definition. Through faith that purifies it. Go to Acts 15, verse 6. Acts 15, verse 6. We've been learning this past week that faith opens the door for us to have a relationship with God and understand the things of God. Again, faith opens the door to all things to God. And here we see 
Faith purifies the heart by the grace of God on our behalf. Acts 15, 6. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Gentiles, just as he did to us also. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. You want a new heart and to get rid of this evil one you're stuck with when you're born? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, and He will cleanse your heart. So again, verse 8, And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He also did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. So faith in the Lord Jesus Christ purifies the heart and allows God to give us a new heart. But without faith in Christ, man is stuck in the flesh and with a corrupt heart, as we just see in the scriptures on the board. Now turn to Ephesians 3.14 to amplify that statement again, that faith purifies the heart. Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts, how? Through faith. Faith changes everything, folks. And we know you don't get faith from God unless you're humble first. But when you humble yourself before the mighty hand of the Lord and you ask for faith, He gives it to you. And faith changes everything. It literally makes us a new creature. And in particular, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So faith is the vehicle, if you will, or the avenue by which Christ can dwell in our hearts. And we saw the heart is cleansed by faith in Christ as well. So, this happens at salvation, by grace through faith. And after salvation, we are to guard what we've been given. Try to think about it that way. Because the Bible tells us to guard our hearts. So, at salvation, by grace through faith, God gives us a new heart. And after salvation, we are to guard what He's given us. We're told to guard our hearts. And how do we do that? Also by faith in Christ and His Word. It's amazing how simple it is. If we're humble, we just follow these simple directions and God does the work. So that's what the Spirit has us talking about. So think of the heart as where your motivation lies the core of your beliefs and who you are. Think of the heart as the place where your loyalties lie, even, where you make decisions based on what you really believe. Now, to a certain degree, the heart is a mystery. It can't be seen physically or spiritually. But as we know, God looks at the heart in all we do. Like 1 Samuel 16, we know that passage with David. God looks at the heart while man looks at the outward appearance. So we're told in the scriptures to guard our hearts. Here's one more description of uh, the heart on this continuing definition on the board. The heart functions as the conscience. After David showed insubordination against the anointed king by cutting off the corner of his robe, his heart smote him. 
in 1 Samuel 24, 5. And after Peter's sermon, the audience was cut to the heart in Acts 2, 37. The heart may condemn us, but God is greater than our hearts. I love that verse. 1 John 3, 20. The heart may condemn us. Doesn't sometimes your heart condemn you? I mean, if you're honest. But God is greater than our hearts. Thank God. And David prays that God would create in him a pure heart to replace his defiled conscience, as in Psalm 51, verse 10. So this is akin to the fact that we know what's right and wrong in our heart of hearts, so to speak. People will lie to themselves. They'll rationalize, as we know, like we all do. But God has given us an inner being to know what's right and wrong. But, again, don't think that you can fully understand what we're talking about and what's spoken of on the board. Look at our next point, how the heart works. This is all supernatural stuff. This is all supernatural stuff. We can only understand so much of what we're getting, even in the Scripture. We can only comprehend so much how the heart and the mind and the conscience function together in a spiritual fashion cannot be put in a road map. And that's good because God wants us to rely on Him by grace through faith to teach us, to show us how to live this way, to show us how to guard our hearts, to rely on Him daily, telling Him you need His help, His understanding. So again, this is all supernatural stuff. How the heart and the mind and the conscience function together in a spiritual fashion cannot be put on a road map. We're talking about supernatural, spiritual function that the Lord has provided to us and for us. And what does God want from us? Humility. And then all these things supernaturally, spiritually happen in you, the one who humbly follows Christ. But we want to get a better understanding of the heart, and I hope this has given you a better picture of that so that as we continue in this topic, uh, you know what we mean when we're saying beware, you know, where your heart turns. So on the board, one last comment on this definition of the heart, according to BibleStudyTools.com. The greatest commandment, according to Jesus, is love the Lord your God with all your heart. In Matthew 22, 37. Love here is more than emotion. It is a conscience, conscious commitment to the Lord. So again, I hope you have a better picture of the heart now, according to Holy Scripture, according to all these points and verses. Speaking of the supernatural and the functions of the heart, Beware that our lips can say one thing and our heart can be thinking another. Or our heart is not committed to that which we say we believe. Anyone guilty of that? Anyone just done things because you're supposed to do things or you want to look good in front of people or you got to do, quote unquote, do the right thing so you don't get in trouble and your heart is totally in the other direction? But God looks at the heart. So beware of that thing, too. That's a religious thing that we all have. We all have a little religion in us where we, we, we do the right things, quote, unquote, but our heart is not in it. So turn with me to Isaiah 29, verse 13, just to get a healthy warning And we're told in Scripture to examine our own hearts. And we're told that for a reason, obviously. You guys are all so innocent. Nobody raised their hand on that one. At least give me a little, you know, confidence boost. (laughs) Isaiah 29, 13. Then the Lord said... Because this people draw near with their words 
and honor me with their lip service. Did I give you the right chapter? Isaiah 29, 13. Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, because they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rope. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of the discerning men will be concealed. Notice in this passage, these people are saying the right things, folks. They're using the name of the Lord, but their hearts are far from Him. They get stuck in religion and probably doing that even for the wrong reasons. So stay humble. (laughs) Examine your own hearts before the Lord. Examine why you do what you do between you and the Lord. After all, this whole thing, if you think about it, and what the Spirit's been giving us for quite some time now, this whole thing is about living the life that our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, has called us to live. We're called to live a new life. We're called to come here to learn for the purpose of going out there and living it. Because without living it, you're a hero who deludes yourself. You're not a doer of the word. Right? Prove yourselves doers, doers of the word. Why, why are we here? We're here to live a life that brings glory to our God and Savior. And that starts with examining your heart. And that's why you need the word of God every single day. Or you will be deceived in some area of your life. It's not rocket science, folks. It's really simple, right? But it takes humility to actually do it. It takes humility to actually submit to the word every day in some way. It depends if you want to be bringing the most glory to God or if you want to live your own life and therefore live in deception. I mean, this is a heavy message, right? It's an important topic. Um, but if you're humble, if you really want to know the truth and you're, you're fed up with the flesh and you're ready to put the world aside, finally after all these years, then this is where true life is. This is where true happiness and peace lies. If you're humble. We saw this principle on the board a few weeks ago, which also is part of the inspiration for this topic. Second Peter 3.17, Peter is warning us to be on guard against the presence of false doctrines from unprincipled, lawless men who have given in to the lusts of their flesh. Again, be on guard is the message. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter 3, verse 14. 2 Peter 3, 14. This passage should also mean more to you now, as you'll see several recent themes come together. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So part of our message is being on guard for those in our lives who can pull us away, who have access to us in some area of our lives, even those we love. Again, the point on the board, Peter is warning us to be on guard 
against the presence of false doctrines from unprincipled lawless men who have given in to the lusts of their flesh. We believers in Christ are to abide in the truth, to cling to the absolute truth found in the word of God only, which is Christ himself. So (laughs) be on guard, like the passages we read in the beginning in Proverbs 2 and Proverbs 4. Watch over your hearts diligently because there's a battle. There's people coming at you and you don't even realize they're coming at you, trying to sway your heart trying to take you captive in a way. A few weeks ago, I shared with you a couple passages from Jeremiah in light of this idea of being on guard. Turn to Jeremiah 15, verse 15. We're going to a lot of scripture this morning, and I hope you appreciate it because the Spirit's saying, just see what plainly stated scripture tells you. He's been saying that to us for years now. Stop over-doctrinalizing everything, hyper-dispensationalizing everything. Read the Word of God in context and see what the Spirit is telling you. Because the Holy Spirit is your true teacher. Jeremiah 15, 15. I've got to start giving you the verses, huh? I always do that, I know. I'll get better. You who know, O Lord, remember me, take notice of me, and take vengeance on me, uh, for me on my persecutors. Do not, in view of your patience, take me away. Know that for your sake I endure reproach. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. I did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, nor did I exult. Because of your hand upon me, I sat alone, for you filled me with indignation. This came up a couple weeks ago. Don't join in with the partiers in this world because it's the easy thing to do, especially if their hearts aren't with the Lord. This is part of being on guard. See where he says, I did did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, nor did I exult like the world rejoices in worldly things. So this is part of being on guard, protecting your heart and your soul from negative influences in the world. And ask yourself a question, by the way. Why would you want to hang out and party with those whose hearts aren't with the Lord? Honestly, what's your reason? What's your motivation? Is it godly? Maybe it is. I'm not judging. It's between you and the Lord. But if we're honest, many times it's not a godly motivation. So just another warning from the Spirit in verse 17. Jeremiah says, I did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, nor did I exult. Because your hand upon me, because of your hand upon me, I sat alone. For you filled me with indignation. Why has my pain been perpetual? and my wound incurable, refusing to be healed. Will you indeed be to me like a deceptive stream with water that is unreliable? Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will restore you. Before me you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. For they, or or they for their part, may turn to you. But as for you, you must not turn to them. That really is the scripture that is the impetus for this topic this morning. They, for their part, may turn to you, but as for you, you must not turn to them. And don't think you're above it all. Smarty pants. Intellectual morons. Don't think you're above it all. You're weak. You're pathetic without relying on Christ. But do you see the battle going on here? In this passage even? Do you see the struggle? Almost like a tug of war on the board? Because we are in a spiritual tug of war. It's not a bad analogy. See the guy on the left in the darkness? 
consumed by his flesh. He's trying to pull you with him onto his side of things. And you know the funny part? The guy on the left in the darkness, he doesn't even think he's doing anything evil or wrong. But he is trying to sway you because he's influenced by the wrong spirits. And you, unless you're on guard, can be taken captive. So think about it this way. There's a constant persuasion and pulling from this world from the forces of darkness. It's constant. You know, it's, it's just, you know, you might hear a white noise, right? Like you put the fan on at home. It's a white noise, right? It keeps going and going and going and going. Well, that, that's, that's the constancy of the persuasion that's trying to pull you in this world. That's why we need the Lord and his word every day. If you're a believer in Christ, you are in the light, and you habitually fight for the light, hopefully, persuading people towards God and his son. Yet there's a constant pull in the other direction, sometimes from individuals or from the media or from authorities, etc. There's a pull for you to turn towards them in some way. Turn towards them. To give in on the tug of war. To say, ah, I'm tired. I throw in the towel. And you let the rope go. Right? And you mosey on over and congratulate them for beating you. And now you're in the darkness. Don't let go of the rope. Don't stop in your persistence. The true believer will pers persevere as we've been studying. It's really the ongoing battle between the flesh and the spirit that's going on. And the devil's not going to help. He's trying to trip you while you're pulling the rope. But the spirit is more powerful than all of them, of course. On the board, here's a quote from Pastor's blog two weeks ago called Wally Cleaver's Nose. The very best the flesh can hope for in its dwindling plight is to influence our perspective to get a believer's attention diverted to unholy standards set up to ultimately keep us in bondage to the opinions of man. In other words, the flesh is losing, ultimately. The devil is losing, ultimately. They're getting closer and closer till the end. So the very best the flesh can hope for in its dwindling plight is to influence our perspective. Might we say influence our heart? To get a believer's attention diverted to unholy standards set up to ultimately keep us in bondage to the opinions of man. Doesn't it suck to be in bondage to the opinions of man? I mean, think about it. When you, get, when you give somebody too much credibility, when you look to their every word and they're not even a godly person, right? And you are captive to the opinions of man. Certain people in your life. Drop it. Turn to divine wisdom instead for that reliance. And speaking of being in bondage to the flesh and the opinions of man, turn to Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. As we've seen in our studies on the gospel, where does trusting take place? Where does faith take place? It takes place in the heart as in Romans chapter 10. Your heart is either trusting in mankind or it's trusting in the Lord. So again, verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. And he will not be anxious. I'm sorry, I lost my place. He will not fear when the heat comes, 
but its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. The heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. There's a lot in that passage, folks. You might want to go home and read that again and just dwell on it between yourself and the Spirit. It's a very humbling passage. But where, where's your heart? Who have you been trusting in lately? The Lord seeks the heart. And only we can look at our own hearts and see where we're at between us and Him. Now, while you're open to that passage, look on the board at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. It says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will, bring both, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Does that passage look a little familiar? Look down at your Bible again at verse 10, Jeremiah 17. I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Basically the same message in 1 Corinthians 4, 5 on the board. Disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. The deeds we do, whether good or bad, begin in the heart, where our motivation lies. And God is always looking at the heart. So the message this morning is to be on guard. Be on guard for who your heart is trusting in as we just read in Jeremiah 17, is it the ways of man or is it the ways of God? And these things are very subtle, folks. That's why you need to stop and examine your hearts. Examine why you do th certain things. These things are very subtle. Be on guard for the ways of man because if it's what you've always known, if it's what you've grown up with, then to you it's normal. But it may not be good. So be willing to change. Be humble enough to look at something and call it out for what it is. Maybe evil in your life. And say, hey, I'm, I'm done with letting my heart be abused by that thing. That seems good on the outside, but I can see what it's doing to me on the inside. And drop it. Keep your eyes on the cross and the absolute truth of God's word. And don't be swayed to turn to the right or the left. For example, there are people who intellectually rationalize. And they're very smart, they're, they're very uh, uh, good with their words, and they're easy to buy into. People are often full of evil speculation, even though they sound good. And people are trying to pull you away from pure faith in the Lord. As instructed on the board, the Lord instructed Jeremiah again in Jeremiah 15, 19, part C. They for their part may turn to you, but as for you, you must not turn to them. So be on guard, folks. The idea of turning is mentioned a lot in Holy Scripture. And it starts with a turning of the heart and leads to a turning in actual direction in the living of the life. As the Lord said, he will then judge based on the resulting deeds. We've noted over the last couple of years how important turning is in coming to salvation. So this is where I'll begin to close. And then we'll celebrate communion. On the board regarding turning in salvation. The unbeliever must turn away from sin and self and turn towards Christ in his heart. 
and this true turning will also have certain good deeds resulting. Again, the unbeliever must turn away from sin and self and turn towards Christ in his heart. And this true turning will also have certain good deeds resulting. We've seen this and studied this now for a couple of years. The scriptures are on the board again. Mark 1.15, Luke 9.23, Romans 10.9 through 10, etc. We see that, the, uh, that principle in a, a lot of the Lord's teachings and parables, the principle on the board, this idea of turning in salvation. We see it all throughout the four Gospels, if you read in context. There is a turning from what one relies on for their current security. For example, one's own goodness. You have to turn from that if you think that's what's going to save you. Or one's stature or wealth in this world. So there's a turning from what one relies on for the current security, and there's a turning to Christ alone as the source of security and salvation. Until a person repents of their sinfulness toward God and admits he can't save himself, he won't truly turn to Christ as his Lord and Savior. But how about once we finally make that turn by the grace of God? How about once we're saved through this surrender to Christ as our only hope? Do we need to turn daily from one thing to the other? Do we need to turn daily from sin and self to Christ as our deliverer? Yes, as we've been learning. We're saved daily. In fact, it's the same simple, pure pattern that God asks of us after salvation on the board, turning in the spiritual walk. Repentance and faith are the daily way to walk with God to be delivered daily from sin and death experientially. And that's part of what we're talking about in this series. Be careful where your heart turns. Turning in the spiritual walk, repentance and faith are the daily way to walk with God. Remember, faith opens up the doors, doesn't it? Through faith, the doors are open to understand the things of God and even to receive his power. Repentance and faith are the daily way to walk with God, to be delivered daily from sin and death experientially. So we got a lot to dwell on. I hope you go and look up some of these passages we covered this morning, and we'll continue with this topic again on Tuesday evening. For now, let's uh, turn to celebrating communion. Uh, ushers, please. Get the elements passed out, and let's get some music, please.
Okay. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, you might look at the point on the board just to ponder. Who are you trusting in your heart, man or God? I mean, at salvation, we finally made the decision, as stubborn as we might have been, to drop self and our own ideas and trust in Christ alone as our Lord and Savior. Um, that's what we're celebrating here today, that salvation was that simple and pure, that much a gift of God. It's not something in any way we could have ever earned. It was a turning of the heart, if you will, from self or sin to the Lord himself as your only hope. So just keep that in mind as we celebrate communion. In 1 Corinthians 11.23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In memory of our Lord, let's eat the bread. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In memory of our Lord, let's drink the cup. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege of coming before you in this way as your adopted family in unity of the faith we thank you that Jesus Christ is our one and only hope that you've made it clear and pure and that through his perfect sacrifice on the cross we can be healed spiritually forever Father, we're so grateful for this reality and your marvelous plan of salvation. We ask that you help us bring this truth out to a lost and dying world that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Christ's precious name and by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you.